Good morning, everybody, and welcome to our final installment of Musical Mornings with Rock Island Sound and the Children's Museum. My name is Rachel, for those of you who haven't met me yet, and I am a voice, guitar, and piano instructor here at Rock Island Sound. And for the past six weeks, we've been doing these musical mornings. All of our instructors have been talking about different topics, and I is doing a history of American popular music, and then on Tuesday, I shifted it to a brief history of the beginning of American musical theater. And today, for our final stream, I'm gonna be finishing up the history of American musical theater with some more modern influential figures and a discussion of some more modern shows. Um, thank you if you've been tuning in for the past six weeks, it's been fun. Um, and if you have any more questions about any of these figures, you could always write in the chat and be interactive with me during this last session because I've definitely wanted some more interaction. Um, but why don't we just get started? Let's just jump right into it. Um, cool. So we talked about a lot of classic composers, song and duos, and sort of how musical theater came to be on Tuesday. We started discussing that, how it sort of came from burlesque and vaudeville and the combination of all of these different older performances, performance uh, concepts, and sort of put together when different songwriting partners and composers started writing music and incorporating themes and motifs into their work, making it what the modern musical is. So, we talked about a lot of people last time, but this time we're going to start by talking about another um, songwriting duo, composing duo, and that's Kander and Ed. John Kander was the composer, and Fred Ebb was the lyricist. So these are two very influential guys. They are known primarily for their stage musicals, like Cabaret and Chicago, which are two of the most phenomenal shows. Um, but they also scored several movies, including Martin Scorsese's New York, New York, um, which the, that signature song became well known under Frank Sinatra. Um, and they also wrote a lot of material for Liza Minnelli, which is pretty awesome as well. And the thing about songwriting duos is that one of them, like I said, is the composer and one of them is the lyricist. And so it gives a lot of room for uh, positive collaboration and different ideas to get shuffled through without sort of giving and leaving all of that responsibility up to one person. Now, it also definitely can create tension in a friendship if you don't have sort of your work and your friendship lives separated. But most of these duos lasted for a long time. There was no comp competition or anger there. Um, they all really just were successful and happy with what they were doing, being on their different parts of the team and completing that. Um, but let's move to a figure who I'm absolutely, uh, I love her so much. Um, this is an American actress, singer, and children's book author who's been working in musical theater, TV, and film for five decades. You have any guesses? One of the most critically acclaimed Broadway performers. She received seven Tony nominations, won two, and was nominated for three Emmys. She's regarded by many as the foremost interpreter of the works of Stephen Sondheim. Does anyone have an idea as to who that could be? Well, I will tell you. Have you ever heard of Bernadette Peters? So it's Bernadette Peters. She is an absolute icon in the musical theater world. Like I said, seven Tony noms, morphing in the industry for five decades now. And a lot of people, yeah, regard her as the best interpreter of Stephen Sondheim's works. Um, She 
she was in his show Mac and Mabel, in his show Sunday in the Park with George, and Into the Woods, Annie Get Your Gun, Gypsy, and Hello Dolly. I'm lucky enough to have seen Bernadette Peters in Hello Dolly, even in her 70s. She's absolutely still there, so talented, can totally own the stage, and it's such a phenomenal show that takes you back to the early 1910s, back to where we started with our history. But Hello Dolly really focuses on that time period. Um, and it, it takes place in Westchester as well, which is really, really fun. Um, <laughs> so another composer and lyricist that I want to discuss, this is a one person and not a songwriting duo, um, would be William Finn. So, he, his first show that he wrote was the musical Falsettos, and this received the 1992 Tony Award for Best Original Score. Um, it is a heavily, the thing about William Finn is that he's a heavily autobiographical, autobiographical writer. And so what does that mean? He's always writing his own lyrics, taking stories from his own life, and really being, um, really focusing on his own experiences and just incorporating those into the plot with different characters, but really staying true to himself and the things that have happened in his life. So there, his topics included being Jewish, being gay, and different things in contemporary America, as well as family, belonging, sickness, which are, is pretty topical right now. Um, but most famously, William Finn wrote the music for and the lyrics for the 25th annual Putnam County Spelling Bee, which is a very well-known show. It's a famous show that a lot of people really like. It's a good show to do it in middle schools and high schools because it's a very reasonable cast and there's a good ratio of men and women. It's a really cool show. Um, I highly recommend checking it out if you haven't seen it or listening to the soundtrack, at least. Um, but one other composer, playwright, and lyricist that is noted for exploring many social justice issues would be Jonathan Larson. So he worked on multiculturalism, homophobia, different things in his, in his materials. And so he was actually born in White Plains and he won three posthumous Tony Awards. So he won these after he passed away and a Pulitzer Prize for drama for his musical. Does anybody have any guesses? Who, what this musical would have been because it's a very very famous musical um, it's Rent it's Rent um, Rent is definitely not a show for kids but it's always important to start learning about these issues at a young age um, definitely not the type of show you'd immediately watch, not the first show you'd show your son or daughter, but it's important to talk about what goes on in some of these shows and that they'll hopefully be able to watch them later on. So Jonathan Larson wrote Rent, a lot of it from his own experiences, and he really, you know, it, the show took off after he passed away. and He didn't get to see it really re reach the level of fame that it did, unfortunately, um, but before he also was in the process of writing a rock opera, retelling the story of George Orwell's 1984. And unfortunately, he never finished that either. But that would have been very cool to see, I think, for a lot of us. We like the book 1984 almost feels like our current lives. Um, so it would have been pretty interesting to see. Um, but let's move on to a little bit of a happier topic, and that would be Ashman and Menken. Some of you might know composer Alan Menken. Um, they're a high, he was a highly successful one of the songwriting duo. They both were very successful, but Alan Menken, I think, is a little bit more well known. Um, and Howard Ashman, the lyricist. So they teamed up in 1982 to create the musical Little Shop of Horrors. Little Shop, Little Shop of Horrors, Little Shop, Little Shop of Horrors. So Ashman directed it. And then they went on together to write the screenplay. And little did they know, but shortly after this, Disney found them. Disney discovered the partnership, 
So then they work together in The Little Mermaid, Beauty and the Beast, and Aladdin. Those were all created by Ashwin Menken. Sadly, Ashwin passed away at 41 before Aladdin was even finished, but Menken continued to write for Disney and still does. But unfortunately, the lyrical spark provided by Ashman was never fully equaled. But Menken kept up the amazing work, and he held the legacy for a long time, which I think is really impressive, um, especially when you lose your, your songwriting partner in the midst of, of writing something. It's not the easiest thing to deal with. Um, another very famous songwriting partner would be Aaron's and Flaherty. Aaron's and Flaherty. That's Stephen Flaherty and lyricist and uh, Lynn Aaron's. And so Stephen was the composer. So these are two New York City people um, and they're best known for the musicals Once on This Island, Seussical, and Ragtime. And they also scored the music for the animated film musical Anastasia. But Once on This Island and Ragtime and Seussical are all very iconic pieces that now are constantly performed in local theaters, high schools, different things like this. Um, Ragtime is an especially topical show right now with fantastic music. I highly recommend Ragtime. It's one of my absolute favorites. If you're listening, if you want to get some good 1920s history, 1910s, 1920s history and Ragtime jazz music with a focus on different relations in the United States also taking place in Westchester, I highly recommend looking up Ragtime, finding a way to watch some version of it or just listening to the soundtrack because it's very, very powerful. So that was Aaron's and Flaherty who wrote Ragtime. So the one last person I want to talk about before we just talk a little bit more generally is Lynn manuel Miranda, which I'm sure most of you know who that is. Um, Lynn manuel Miranda is an American composer, lyricist, playwright, rapper and actor, best known for creating and starring in the Broadway musicals In the Heights and Hamilton, of course. So when Lin-Manuel Miranda's Hamilton came to the Broadway stage in 2015, it absolutely changed the, the, the culture and the structure of musicals as we know them. Um, instead of being a niche, a niche, um, a niche thing that only New York elites could take place, take part in. Hamilton created a cultural phenomenon and that was totally, it had been seen before, but not in the modern scale that it was seen with Hamilton. And he, he really, he got three Tony Awards, three Grammys, and um, he's also gotten a Pulitzer Prize. And he's definitely most celebrated for writing the book, Music and Lyrics to Hamilton. Like, yeah been acclaimed as a pop culture phenomenon since its Broadway premiere in August 2015. Um, but he also co-wrote songs for Moana. He starred in the upcoming Mary in the well, he starred in what was a pretty recent Mary Poppins Returns. Um, and he's still doing a lot of work. The Hamilton show just got posted to Disney Plus. He's definitely still working on more material that we're all very excited to see. Um, and yes, and um, I think we all can't wait to see what else he's gonna do. But for now, that's actually the end of our influential figures. This is basically going to be the end of our, our last musical morning session. I just wanna wrap up by talking about how musical theater evolved. Last, on Tuesday, we talked about, you know, the 30s to the 60s, essentially, the 20s to the 60s. And this week, we're sort of talking about the 60s onward. Um, and how did it evolve? So at the beginning, there wasn't that much for people to focus their musicals on. They only knew a certain amount of things. And that's why Oklahoma and different shows at the beginning were all sort of focused around the same lifestyle, on a farm, love interest, coming of age, and yet still very on a farm in the country with no clear, um, not a lot of fully realized supporting characters and things like that. And as the decades go on further, there's obviously more history that is created to, that then can be written about um, in hindsight, but there was a 
sort of blast in really fleshing out all of the characters in the show, making sure that they all stood a purpose and not just having filler. In the early days, there was a lot of filler happening for um, quick laughs or, you know, easy transitions. And that definitely still happens. But for the most part, there are a ton of supporting characters in shows nowadays that hold a very important purpose. And that wasn't super the case back at the beginning. What else has changed? Um, as we talked about with Oklahoma being incredibly influential, that it was the sort of first show to utilize themes and motifs, that's just gotten even bigger and more prominent since the 40s when Oklahoma came to be. Um, shows nowadays teach an overarching lesson. They keep this theme constantly referenced. Um, and it is all about learning something and taking something away and leaving the theater thinking, oh, I, I'm not quite, I'm not fully sure of everything that happened or why it happened. I know what happened, but I, I have to think more about it. And I think that's the most powerful thing that musical theater has done now is that it leaves you really, really thinking versus at in the beginning, uh, in the older days. It definitely made you think, but not to the same extent. And now we have a lot more writers and teams that go into creating some of these shows to make them as thought-provoking and controversial or exciting and worthy of discussing after you leave the theater as it's ever been before. Um, now we also have such, you know, we have so much technology. So we have the ability to access choreographers, to access different people, to be in shows from all around the world, whereas in the early days, that wasn't super effective. I mean, you could call people on the phone, but you were limited to what was around, what was in New York to go on Broadway, or what was in your city for your, for their theater company. And now there's really a way to get anybody from anywhere to be a part of a show, part of a cast, um, which definitely changes things because if you're someone like Lin-Manuel Miranda and you're writing Hamilton and you have a clear vision of the entire cast, instead of holding an open audition in New York or picking from the people who are currently in the Broadway company programs, you can call everybody that you know that you want to be in the show and then they can just be in it. Um, so there's a lot of technical differences like that as well. What else is different? The amount of budget, profit, the profit margin is different, but the budgets that these shows have now to create fantastic sets um, to make these entire stories come to life in ways we never thought possible. Now, that's definitely something that's different. They did not have the funds nor the budget to put on a show with an extensive, insane, moving pieces set. But now they do. Um, they have an ability to really make you feel like you were there and you're a part of it. So there's so much that's changed. Just like in popular music, there's so much that's changed, but there's still clear lines of influence from the beginning. Every show that comes out still has a clear influence. It has a clear uh, somebody that they, that the composer, lyricist, or creator had admired. And a lot of that, if you know the history, can really show through. So there's so much more to be said, but that's where we're going to leave off today. I hope that this was interesting for some of you. Um, remember that if you'd like to sign up for a voice, guitar, piano lesson with me at Rock Island Sound, uh, you can. I'm available on many days, most days. Um, I've had a really good time these past six weeks doing these streams. You can always rewatch them if you want to hear about the history of any decade um, in popular music. So make sure to check that all out and have a wonderful Friday, everybody. Bye!